Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll just, um, can you hear me? Okay. Is that loud enough? Awesome. Okay. I'm just going to um, take a photo for the fans. <laughs> Let's flip this around. Awesome. Okay. Um, now live at hashtag DDDBNE. And then the other hashtag for today, for this talk, is Chuck, Chuck JS. Can't believe it's butter, no. So, hashtag DDDBNE and Chuck JS. Chuck JS. Um, I did have the hashtags on there, but they disappeared. So, hey, look, a little bit about me. I am Joshua Wolf, the legendary recruiter from Just Digital People. And uh, I was born in New Zealand, um, you know, back in the days when it was still black and white there. And then it went to color, sort of midway through my youth. And I got my first computer when I was 11 years old. I, uh, my cousins are actually in the All Blacks, and some of them play in France professionally rugby. But I wasn't diagnosed as being short-sighted until I was like 11 or 12. So I grew up completely unable to see the ball at all. So my parents would send me to sports games, and they'd be going, come on, chase the ball, chase the ball. And I was like, where is it? <laughs> So I got into reading and I got into computers. And um, this was a, a little nano computer that came to New Zealand called the Casio PB100. It had 544 bytes of RAM and you could put 10 programs at a time on it. And uh, it was programmed in basic. So I started programming with that. Uh, I went to Mount Albert Grammar School, which is a, a school in the center of Auckland that has a farm on it. So you can learn farming because it's New Zealand. And uh, while I was there, I also studied Latin which is one of those things that you do, at least you did back then. And I got my hands on an Atari 800XL computer. And I programmed that in basic, and I would stay up overnight, I'd get the magazine out, and I'd start typing in all those machine code commands, you know, data, and then all the numbers for the assembly language, get till the morning, try to run the program, it wouldn't run, and then I'd have to turn it off, and I didn't have any storage, so. Um, I got a book on Pascal, but we didn't have any Pascal compilers at the time in New Zealand, so I had to just code it on paper. So I wrote all my programs down. And this is my pick for the future, retro programming. It's gonna be like this. People programming on paper by hand and then OCRing the code <laughs> in with a phone. Yeah, you heard it here first at DDD 2015. Uh, and then in New Zealand, we invented this computer called the Poly. It was amazing, it had color and everything, and they had those at my school, but I never got to use them. And I went to the university, we had uh, Mac computers, and inside one professor's office, they had this computer locked in there, it was the LC2, it was like totally state of the art at the time. And I arrived at the university, I'd been programming since I was 11, and I was in computer science lectures with people who literally had never touched a computer before. So I um, ended up bouncing out and doing something different, and became a commercial software developer, and uh, found Ball and Delphi, which was Anders sort of uh, thing before he did C Sharp. Then there was uh, that moment where I got object-oriented enlightenment, because it was my first contact with object-oriented programming. Then there was the incident, the lawsuit, the lifelong ban from professional software development. You probably read about it in, in the news. The less said about it, the better. And uh, so I've had to turn to recruitment to uh, pay the bills. Uh, and then I went and spent three years in South America, you know, around that whole time. And uh, while I was there in South America, a couple of things happened. The first one was that I went on a trip into the Amazon jungle, and that was when I discovered my spirit guide, Chuck Norris. And it was um, kind of a vision that happened there. I don't know, has anyone here been to South America before? A few people? Yeah. There's, um, there's this thing that they have there called ayahuasca. Um, apparently it's some kind of uh, tribal kind of thing. Anyway, you go out into the jungle, you have these visions, uh, that's when I met Chuck. Yeah. yeah. Tigers? Um, <laughs> I saw some that night, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so that was, that was one of the things that I saw there. And then the other one was that I discovered that those guys actually speak Latin. 
And then when I was in school, people were like, why are you learning Latin? You're never going to use it. What a waste of time. And then I showed up in South America and I'm like, hey, these guys are speaking Latin. They're speaking my language. So I learned it very quickly. One of the things I discovered about Spanish as it is now is that it's run by this academy called the, the Royal Academy of Spanish. And they take, it, um, they take that stuff pretty seriously, like really seriously. And then, oh, sorry, I've got to stay on camera. Thank you. Uh, and then the French have their own academy, but um, you know the French are a little bit kind of more laid back. And then while I was there, I started uh, teaching English because I figured, oh, you know, that's something that I can do. I know how to do that. Um, and then that's when I discovered something about. Um, about England and English compared to those languages. So England had gone through this kind of uh, historical kind of uh, journey. I'm sitting there trying to explain to this guy how it all works, you know, the, the English language. Um, I might get this thing started while I'm doing, so what I'm going to do here on this thing, I'll flip it on there, is I've got an Android tablet here. It's going to be a, kind of a few different things going on all at once here. Um, which button do I press for this thing? Document camera. Yeah. OK, so here's my, can you see that? Yeah, cool. This is my Android tablet. So what I'm going to have going on on this thing is um, I've got a browser here. It's running inside the Android operating system. It's got a JavaScript virtual machine in it. And um, it's running Linux inside the JavaScript virtual machine. It's a little bit slow. It's going to boot up. And then uh, what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to be installing the .NET Core CLR, the open source version of .NET, so that we're running .NET uh, on Linux inside a JavaScript virtual machine on Android. <laughs> and basically, once that, once that happens, at some point during this talk, that is the, basically the, uh, the completion of human civilization. <laughs> and we'll be free to go to the stars from that point. So the singularity here this afternoon at DDD 2015. So I'm going to leave that booting um, while I just tell you a little bit more about what happened in South America. So in, I'm sitting in front of this guy, and, and uh, in my Spanish language classes, I don't know, anyone here speak Spanish, studied Latin? Yeah, a few people, OK. So even the, even the irregular kind of uh, things have regular rules that go with them. The irregular irregularities, they have regular rules. It's a, it's a very structured language. And because they have those academies that rule over the language, like Spanish and the, the French do, they, it's, like, um, it's like Pascal, you know? Pascal was this deliberately created language inside academia, and it was very structured and very beautiful and, and, and very nice and very curated. So English is a bit different from the Spanish and the, and the, and the French. See, the, the England was originally invaded by the Saxons, and then they got invaded by the Romans. Then they got invaded by the Vikings. And then they got invaded by the Norman French, all of which left a, an indelible impression on the people who live there. So let's have a look at some words. This thing's still booting over here. I got my notes from Nick Bloomhart's. Who was in Nick's talk about the text parsing? Yeah? OK, cool. Yeah, he had, he's got that text. He's got his text parser, which is called Sprocker. Sprocker. Yeah, so Sprocker is like a German word, and it means, uh, like, in English, we get to speak, right? So, you know, I'm sitting there with this guy. I'm trying to explain to him how English works, and I make a real simple rule. You know, I say, uh, let me make this a bit bigger so you can see it. Preferences, code, preferences, user space. Edit to font size. Let's try 30. Nice and big. Cool. And then we'll go full screen. And then we'll go back to words. And we'll close the side one. OK. I was copying his code. Um, Sprecher. Yeah. So I'm talking, I'm talking to this, this, this Spanish-speaking guy, and I'm saying it's real simple in English. We just have this rule where you take a word, a verb, and you just add ed to the end of it, and that's how you get the past tense. You know, like ask, we just say asked. Talk, 
we just say talked. Walk, we just say walked. But then you have a look at some words like this, like sprecher, which is speak. Well, speak is not speaked, right? It's spoke. Break is not braked, it's broke. Get is not getted, it's got. And take is not taken, it's took. But then there's another kind of pattern as well, which is that eat is not eated, it's ate. Say is not said or so, it's said. And then sit is not sitted, it's sat. Buy, bought, of course. <laughs> Bring, um, brought. Go, easy. Went. <laughs> and then I'm like, <laughs> I don't know, there is a rule somewhere in there. Um, you yeah, locked, easy, yeah, that one, guaranteed, guaranteed, dictated, yeah. Uh, and then so if you want to say it was spoken, past participle I think that's called, spoken, broken, okay, that makes sense, walked, we walked there, the track was walked, yep, got, gotten, taken, took, taken, okay, there's a bit of a pattern there. Ate and eat, eaten. Said, said again, sat. Hang on, <laughs> sat. It was, it, I, it was bought, okay. It was brought. I don't know how you'd say it was went. Um, okay. <laughs> you know, when I look at this here, it looks to me like, see this one here, eat, it follows this kind of rule of like an internal modification here but then it goes like taken. See, taken, taken, and took, there's the internal modification. This word to me looks like it used to have another letter in the front of it. Like if it was like this, it would actually follow the same pattern or something similar, I don't know. Hey, actually, that could be it. Uh, so look, you know, how do you find these rules? So it's like there are different languages all mashed together in the English language, and they've actually imported their own syntaxes with them, their own grammars. So you can actually see a little bit of the kind of history of the English language in here. This internal modification of the vowel sound to get the different tense versus the, the synthetic kind of aggregation of this ed on the end. This one here guaranteed is really interesting as well because you've got this other word in English, warranted. And it's actually the same word because, you know, there was that guy, William the Conqueror, and his name is also spelt like this, William. I actually went and found out more about it afterwards because I was just sitting in front of this guy going, I got no idea. I can speak the language, but I just don't know how it works. So I checked it out. Apparently what happened was there are two versions in uh, regions in France, one where they have the GW, or the GU, and the other one where they have the W, and it's the same sound. So when the Normans invaded at one point, they came from one region and they brought the word guarantee with them. And then at another point in history, the same word came into the English language, but from another region of France, and we ended up with two words in English, both imported at different times, but it's the same word. And when you think about it, guarantee and warranty are basically the same thing. So that's where that one came from. Um, what else was there about that? Go and went. Well, that's an interesting one because it's actually two different words again. Like went is actually the past tense of the word wend. IntelliSense is trying to figure out what I'm doing. Wend. And the only time you really hear about the word wend is like if it's a river wending its way poetically through the pasture. Um, here's an interesting one. This is classes in English. This is good. So these words here are actually the, um, like the, the Anglo-Saxon names of animals. And then when you look at the animal when it's been cooked, you get this. A cow becomes beef, sheep becomes mutton, deer becomes venison, and a pig becomes pork. And these ones are the Saxon name of the animal, the French name of the prepared food. Because the Saxons were like the peasants tending the farm, the French landowners were the ones eating all the food, so the language diverged like that. And when you actually have a look at what we consider to be obscenities in English, they're generally 
the Saxon words for the same activities. You know, like, um, I'm being recorded, so I don't want to say anything that will have to be beeped out. Um, but, you know, when, when you want to get really polite, you'll use something like, um, like the French word, you know, I'm going to the toilet, which is a, a French word. Uh, if you want to get really kind of technical, you'll say to defecate, which is like a, a Latin word. So we import these Latin words as well, which is why I looked at dictate up here. Dictated, that's a Latin word for sure. And it's, you know, in English we can say he said, he dictated, he spoke. There's a, a number of different words you can use for the same thing. They all come from different languages. Anyway, after going through this kind of conversation with this guy, um, you know, what I came to was a deep respect for the clippy. <laughs> I don't know how that guy does it, man, but dude, talk about parsing difficult things to parse. Man, he's got it going on. Yeah, he's kind of like Jar Jar Binks, you know, of, of word processing, but you know, as we all know, Jar Jar Binks actually is the Sith Lord running the whole thing, but he looks like an idiot, right? Kind of like Clippy. Um, so this guy here, this fantastic man is Eric S. Raymond. Anyone heard of him before? Yeah, a few people. So he's the author of this book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, Musings on, on Linux and Open Source by an Accidental Revolutionary. And in here he talks about these two different ways that things come about. One is like the cathedrals of Europe, designed by, you know, like the Royal Academy or by an architect, architected and created you know, with a top-down design and a definite vision. And then on the other hand, you've got the bazaar, which is these kind of organically growing marketplaces where people just keep adding things. When I lived in Lima, there's a, an area there called the parada, and which means the stop. So what would happen is from the mountains, the farmers would send down these potatoes and carrots and corn and cabbages into the city. They all stop the trucks, unload them, and they have the Mayorista where they sell these things in large quantities. Enterprising people that they are, the Peruvians will go in, buy a big bag of sack of potatoes for the you know, volume price, take it out the front of the building, sit down on the side of the road, and sell them in small quantities. And so that just kind of expanded and expanded out of there until when I lived there, they'd taken over the entire district. You could no longer drive through the streets anymore. They were filled with these carts and with people with, um, you couldn't even see the concrete anymore. It was covered with, you know, pieces of vegetables and things. And that's a bazaar. And then, you know, in English we have the word bizarre, which means like an unholy juxtaposition of things that should not go together. Uh, I don't know why the, if you look in Wikipedia, it says bizarre comes from an Italian word bizarro, meaning like angry. But there's a Persian word bazaar, which means like a, a marketplace that comes together in this way. So I want to have a look at the history of JavaScript, just with that kind of context in the background, right? Just to kind of create a bit of a, a world of the whole thing. <clears throat> and look, you know, just to be completely clear, I've got no idea what I'm talking about, and this is like based on true events, but, you know, I didn't have enough time to really research it well, but I looked up some stuff on Wikipedia and I got some pictures, so it's good. <laughs> so Chuck Norris cannot be stopped. The man knows neither fear nor mercy. He's amazing. Yeah, Chuck. So, you know, when Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet, the World Wide Web, and connected all of the people in the world for the first time so that they could actually speak to each other, like people who spoke different languages could speak to each other for the first time in history without having to invade another country, then, you know, they were like, okay, man, we need to come up with like an awesome language to go along with this thing called the internet. So there was a young guy who was the CEO of a company called Mozilla, and then he invented this language that's called JavaScript. And that's basically how that happened. And uh, what happened then was basically we were able to have effectively the clippy of the internet. So you could have your web pages could now ask you about what you were doing, and so we were back in the golden ages of the 90s, but this time on the web. And then Facebook invented this thing called AngularJS, and now uh, JavaScript rules the world, basically. But you see, the thing about it is that it's not like a deliberately planned mastermind conspiracy. And this is the way that human beings are, right? 
like we see clouds and we go, oh, it's a dragon, you know? Or, you know, you might be in the jungle and your mind might be like kind of messed up from drinking some Amazonian tribal herb. You see something and you think it's Chuck Norris. It's just the way that humans are, right? We think there's a conspiracy, but actually there isn't one. Um, it's more kind of like just an accidental kind of thing. Like how did English become the lingua franca of the world? I mean, it's honestly got to be one of the most worst designed languages that you could possibly speak, <laughs> which you don't notice if it's what you grew up speaking, right? But try teaching it to someone else who speaks a different language, practically impossible. And yet somehow, so many people are speaking it now, and it's the same thing with JavaScript. You know, it's gone everywhere. And um, now we just have to kind of live with it. <laughs> so it's Chuck on a, um, a visit to Australia. Yeah. So some people say that, you know, programming in JavaScript is like shaving yourself with a razor with no guard on it. You know, and it really takes a real kind of a real programmer to be able to do that. Yeah, it's like all the type safety is gone. It's like if you got your Bic razor out of your, uh, you know, out of its container and you got your nail clippers and you just went, hey man, I like to live dangerously and you just clip those guards off, you know? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. What could possibly go wrong? Then you can invent even more innovative ways. JavaScript is amazing. I'm waiting for someone to re-implement the JavaScript virtual machine in JavaScript. Because Atwood's law is that anything that possibly could be, hang on a second, um, I'm just giving a presentation right now. I'll call you afterwards. OK, thanks, honey. Sorry, that was my wife. I'm going to put my phone onto uh, flight mode. That would be a good idea. Uh, and then re anything that can be implemented in JavaScript will be. That's like the, as, as evolution kind of plays itself out, you know? When, when robots start writing in code, I'm sure they're going to be writing it in JavaScript. Not because it's the best language, but just because it's the one that everybody speaks, right? Uh, and so, yeah, re-implementing the JavaScript virtual machine in JavaScript. That's the kind of thing that you can do with JavaScript. <laughs> so that's why all the best programmers have beards, because you really need that kind of thing to protect yourself when you're programming with no type safety. Richard Stallman, you know, the founder of the GNU project. Um, the guy who invented Gentoo Linux. The um, TJ Holloway Chuck, the uh, guy who wrote all the Node stuff. Nick Bloomhart, the guy who wrote Seek. Um, <laughs> Anna Gerber the uh, famous JavaScript developer in the tech startup scene, Morris, uh, Maurice Butler, the um, BrizJS uh, guy. Um, uh, lots of people with beards <laughs> who are really good programmers. But it, to program in JavaScript, it takes a Chuck Norris beard. Chuck Norris doesn't like to use weapons, but his beard is a deadly weapon itself. So now it's time to do some live coding in JavaScript. When I grow up, I want to have a beard too. Um, but for now, I'm just going to do it without one, because that's just the kind of guy I am. I like to live dangerously, especially after following <laughs> Jeremy's live coding exercise in the last talk. Um, OK, I'm using Visual Studio Code, open sourced, running on uh, the Mac OS X. OK, I'm going to try a different window. Create something new. New. Cool. OK. So let's have a look at some JavaScript stuff. Now, who went to that quality code panel this morning? Who was there? OK, a bunch of people. Great. Man, I reckon that is an awesome, awesome format. It's like the UFC of programming. What happens when you get the karate guy and the sumo wrestler in the cage together? But they didn't take questions. I wanted to say, look, I. There's two .NET guys there, but I reckon if the Haskell guy and the JavaScript girl stick together, you can take them. What is the best language? <laughs> Didn't get the opportunity. But you know, maybe at the next one, we can have it. Technology Smackdown. Uh, but you know, um, Anna did say there that there are conventions in JavaScript programming. That's basically what you have to go by. And that's how the English language develops, right? By convention. There's no Royal Academy 
that tells you that this is in the dictionary and this is out of the dictionary and then chops your head off if you say anything else, like there is in Spanish. They don't still chop people's heads off, but it used to be that way. So it's all done by convention. So I want to just have a look at the kind of evolution of JavaScript and it's kind of like a moment in time of watching this collision of all these kind of ideas. And I'm going to get live code linting from Maurice. <laughs> So look, JavaScript was born in the browser, right? Remember that, that good-looking young guy who was the CEO of um, Mozilla and invented that language called JavaScript, and it was in the browser. And so it was asynchronous by nature. So a real common kind of idea is that you're going to request a resource from somewhere. And let's just say that the... Um, not okay. <laughs> Thanks, Clippy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is going to be my, my object I'm going to return. Data, name, my name. <laughs> can, I, can I change that setting somewhere? <laughs> uh, name, and then I'll put uh, occupation, legendary recruiter. There we go and then um, secret identity. Open source developer. Okay, so you're gonna make a request. That's my object and it's on the internet. Sorry, I misspelled that. <laughs> so I'm gonna request the URL, right? And this is what you'd expect synchronously. Now, if, I, I don't know how much everybody here knows about all the stuff. I'm just going to, like, this is, this is what I know. I'm going to request the URL, and then I'm going to say console log data name, like this. OK. Are you ready, Maurice? Yeah. OK. Execute. You want the result? Mm. Sure. It's asynchronous, but there's no blocking. So it's requested a URL, but it's continued to execute, and the URL hasn't returned. Because you'd expect it to say Joshua Wolf, right? And I'm going, what, what happened? It doesn't. Oh, um, no, even in the browser. Yeah, but especially in like the Node environment, it's asynchronous. And it's like, what happened? OK, so this is how you deal with that, right? You, you pass it a function callback. Nick's talk was awesome, man. It was just like this full-on functional programming thing. I was like, this is crazy. My brain is about to explode. So you give it a callback function. And what you do then is you put this inside your callback function. Data. This is all pseudocoding. It's kind of sort of almost there, but not quite. Function. So my request now takes a URL and it takes a function. So it's going to ask for the URL and it's going to call the callback function. CB is like a uh, JavaScript, um, you know, convention for callbacks. Now it's going to produce this. Callback, so that pattern's just called callback pattern, right? But what happens if there's an error? This. So this becomes the next pattern, right? Um, and it's a again, it's a convention. If there's an error, console log, ba bow. Like that. Uh, else, console log data dot name. So there's that becomes this function signature becomes basically a pattern everywhere. That you have a callback function and it takes an error and a response, and then you just start testing for whether there's going to be an error or not, and then you deal with the data when it comes in. So that's generation one. Then 
there was an invasion. Um, I think I can go, let's go new. And I'm going to open it to the side. Okay, same data. Now this pattern, data equals request. I'm going to request the URL, pass it a callback. Mm -mm. OK, yeah. So in the first generation, it's basically this. This is the world. I'm going to ask for some data. It's going to be asynchronous. And then I need a, a way to deal with the asynchronicity of it. But then after a while, it's like, well, everything's asynchronous all the time. Why is that a big deal? Now what are we thinking about? Then it's like, um, you're thinking about this. Asynchronicity disappears. And you're thinking, I'm dealing with one of two things. I'm either dealing with a response or an error. Because you're just all the time writing, if error, do this. If not error, do that. If error, do this. If not error, do that. And you're like, this kind of sucks. What are we going to do about that? So they changed the idea of the function signature. So it went to something like this. That becomes the function signature as a convention, right? Like none of the stuff is mandated by anyone. Somebody with a big beard came up with a great idea, and then everybody started doing it. Gets down to guys like me with like nothing happening, and we're like, yeah, whatever they say, man. I'll do it too. Um, request URL success failure. So then what you do is you just write two functions. You write a success function, which takes a data. This is its function signature. And then you write a failure function, which takes an error. So you got rid of your conditional testing now. You don't have to say, if an error, do this. If not an error, do that. It's all handled inside this pattern of the request. Am I getting it right so far? It's crazy to me to show up OK, cool. If it looks crazy, it must be JavaScript, man. That's what I love about that stuff. It was life-changing, that moment in the Amazonian forest. Um, so that was the next thing, yeah, this kind of pattern. So then the next thing that came out, so, so then there's this promises. And I think this is what Nick was doing. It's called a thenable. Is that what a delegate is in C Sharp? Anybody know? The delegate like an asynchronous promise about a future event? No? no? I've got no idea what I'm talking about up here, man. <laughs> Luckily, this is not a C Sharp talk. Um, just forget that. I didn't say anything about that. I know nothing about that. I did see he had then. So inside the request function, you do something like this. Let me pull this up here. So your request function signature is now, that's a call to request up, up there. Your request function signature, this is the implementation of request. Function, request, take a URL, take a, now I'm going to give them these names here because this has become a convention as well, resolve and reject. So we're going to do um, one, var data, two, magic. Three, if there's an error, then we're going to reject the error. And if there's data, we're going to resolve the data. Action callback. Yeah. And I want to I want to put in here what this what this implementation looks like to give you an idea. So this implementation here looks like this: function request, and it takes a URL and it takes a callback, and it does if there's an error, callback the error, and it's Probably going to be no result, right? So null. And if there is a result, call back no error and the result. So what I want to draw your attention to here is this. 
it's a convention to drop the null at the end here. Because why would you need that? It's just a null. Nobody's going to treat it at all anyway. This style of programming on the, this one over here, this is like programming with promises. And there's a little bit more to the promises than, than this. But essentially, this is promise style programming. And it's the new style of programming in ES6. Um, and I saw um, Felix Reisenberg, I think his name is. He is one of the open source developers from Microsoft, came here and spoke at the .NET user group. And he was showing me this version of Visual Studio he had running ES7 and everything. He's got async and await happening in JavaScript, which is more syntactic sugar. But um, this is what I mean about shaving yourself with a razor blade with no guard on it. If you have a look at this, these two things look real similar, right? Like real similar. So similar, in fact, that it would be just so easy to do something like this by mistake. Bink. Because both of these kind of styles of programming exist, coexist right now in different libraries that you use, because it's a bizarre. It's not like there is a Royal Academy that says, this is the new style of programming, everything else is out. It's like all of the stuff is just all mashed together. So we have these two different coexisting things. And so this was something that I ran into the other day. What do you think happens if you do that? It thinks it's an error. So my code here goes, ba bow sorry, error, didn't work. And I'm like, what? What didn't work? What happened? I'm looking everywhere, looking everywhere. It's just something as very simple as getting the wrong function signature for the return of the, of the implementation, which is the kind of thing that you catch with your, you know, in C Sharp, you'll define an interface or TypeScript, right? You use TypeScript. You, it's like programming in C Sharp. You get type safety, static typing, compile time checking of functions, function signatures, types, the whole thing. And uh, the great thing about dynamic languages, they're very expressive. You can do crazy things in them, and you can develop things really fast. Like when I start coding something, I don't even know what I'm doing. I, when I get to the end of it, I still don't know what I'm doing. But with C Sharp, it's kind of like you got, I got to define an interface. I don't know what the interface is going to look like. I don't know what I'm doing. But with, with JavaScript, I can just bang it out. But then it gets to a certain point where I make a change like that, and suddenly it's, it continues to execute. And it just does stuff that I didn't intend for it to do. And so catching that kind of stuff, that's what takes most of my time once my code gets to a certain level of complexity. Or who was it today who said that uh, in any project that you're working on, you're always on a team of three people. There's you, there's the past you, and then there's the future you. So whenever I leave my code for any period of time and come back to it, I'm like, man, who is this genius who wrote this code? But I got no idea what he was doing. Um, and finding my way around it and catching that stuff. So you know, there's a bunch of different kind of typing solutions for JavaScript that have come out. There's TypeScript. How many people are using TypeScript? OK, a few people. How many people are programming with the guard completely off, just like freestyling it? <laughs> Respect. And what about uh, Flow? Is anybody using Flow? The thing I like about Flow is it's this gradual typing system. Like it, whenever I, I run into an error like that, I'm like, man, that sucked. That took me two hours to find out what was going on. I'm going to use TypeScript. And then as soon as I start trying to do TypeScript, it's like Microsoft has colonized my project. And my code refuses to talk to any other modules until I like convert all of it. It's probably not that bad. I just don't know what I'm doing with it. But with <laughs> Facebook Flow, <laughs> It's like Clippy has come back. Um, <laughs> can't kill the guy. But with Facebook Flow, you can do gradual typing. So you can type when you want to type and not type when you don't want to type. So you can get that gradual um, introduction of typing in there. What time am I supposed to finish? Anybody know? Do I just keep talking until someone tells me to stop? Just keep, keep writing code and stuff? Um, maybe I should get some people to help me to do my homework. <laughs> 15 minutes. OK, let's see how this thing's going over here. <clears throat> Can we head to the stars yet? OK, so the biggest problem that I've had with this, right, is like, this is awesome. This is Linux running inside the JavaScript virtual machine inside a browser on Android. One of the biggest problems that I've had with it, though, is that the only editor that it's got installed is VI, and I've got no idea how to use it. 
I was at Microsoft Ignite and I met um, one of the guys, because I'm always chatting with people on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever, and even today I'm running into people I've spoken to, I've, I've messaged, and it's like, hey, I know you, and I'm like, that's right, I'm legendary, famous on the internet, and here I am in real life, I actually do exist. Um, not like that guy TJ Holloway Chuck, who reportedly wrote 60% of the Node ecosystem before he left to go to Golang. I have it on very reliable uh, evidence. I read it in an article on the internet that he's actually a team of people writing all of that code. Yeah, and so someone did the investigation and they said, how can any person be so insanely productive as this guy? It must be a group of people. So they went back through all his GitHub commits and they were checking to see where did he commit, what time, um, and what was his coding style? Like, can we see if there are different people writing this code? And they did see that his coding style changed over time, but you know, it's not 100% whether he's actually changed his coding style or if it's multiple people doing it. But he's um, left Node and JavaScript and gone to Go. I don't know if that means anything. Um, the first Go meetup was here in Brisbane a couple of uh, months ago. And while I was there, I was just checking the hashtags for Go. And there's a Go programmer who has 1,239 stars on his GitHub account. He lives in Tanzania. And he has 19 people connected to him on LinkedIn. I was like, this guy's gold. I'm a recruiter, right? I'm like, this guy's gold. Undiscovered gem. I'm going to get this guy to Australia somehow. He's brilliant, brilliant programmer. If anyone is looking for a great Go programmer, I know a really good guy. He's amazing. He does um, CRUD type stuff. When the power's going. That was the thing. You read through his GitHub. Have a look for it and see if you can find him. On his GitHub, you look at it. You're like, wow, man, this guy's knocking it out of the park. Right at the very end, he says, this is what my day looks like. I wait for the power to come on so that I can do my coding. And then I do a git commit. And then the power goes back out, and I can code for a few more hours, and then I have to stop. And um, yeah, he's coding in Go. Go is definitely the future. But JavaScript is now. And um, so <laughs> VI, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, somehow can get this in here. This is the only command I know how to do, right, in VI. This is the only one I, I figured it out. I was like, God, every time I get dumped into VI by Git, like Git would install and it's like default editor would be, um, would be VI. Does anybody else have that problem? Okay, a couple of people, most everybody probably running on Windows, right? And they're like, VI, what's that? Oh, at Microsoft Ignite, did I tell you, I met this guy who I'd been talking to a lot. And he, he just texted me and said, hey, are you at, at Microsoft Ignite? So I took one of my famous selfie photos and sent it to him, and he sent me one, and then we ran into each other so we could recognize each other. And we started talking, and after a while he tells me that, oh yeah, I program in the Windows world, et cetera, et cetera, but I actually do all my C-sharp coding in VI. And I was like, dude, really? And he's like, yeah, yeah, and I actually compile it from source because there's some flags that I want to use with it. And I was like, man, I would never have guessed from the size of your beard that you had that much, like, <laughs> that much power. Um, I was hoping he was going to be here today to help me to get this thing to the next level. Um, the other problem that there is with this JavaScript Linux machine is it doesn't have a network interface. So I wrote to the guy who wrote it. His name is Fabrice. Um, I said to him, hey, Fabrice, how do I get a virtual interface into that emulator so that I can get the .NET Core CLR code onto the machine? And he said, oh, it's really easy. You can just implement one, or you could use a, a virtual USB uh, serial port. I was like, OK, like, anything more than that? Like, what do I do, code it up in VI? Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's where the project is at the moment. Human civilization has not yet reached its pinnacle. There's still a little bit further for us to go. But look, if you get anything out of this, it should be a sense that anything is possible. And um, finally, for you today, here's a question. Given the kind of issues that there are with JavaScript programming, type safety, static time, you know, compile, all of that kind of stuff, and the kind of different typing systems that are out there, ES6, um, it's not really a typing system, it's got some stuff there. Uh, TypeScript, Flow. Here's the question for you. Which typing system does Chuck Norris use? Triple <laughs> Okay, I'll leave you with that thought. No, here's the answer. I actually have the answer to it. Chuck Norris 
whatever, he t what, whatever, whatever code Chuck Norris writes, and Chuck normally writes directly in binary, and then he writes the source code as documentation for other, other developers, and he usually does that in JavaScript, but whatever Chuck Norris writes is always strongly typed. Thank you.